Thank you. Okay, thanks so much, Todd. So uh, thanks everyone for being here. It's truly an honor and privilege to have childhood health and disability researcher, Dr. David Nicholas join us today. David is Professor and Associate Dean of Research and Partnerships in the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Calgary, and is cross appointed to the Department of Pediatrics here at the University of Alberta. He's the author of almost 200 peer reviewed publications in the area of childhood health and disability. Um, Dr. Nicholas has led multiple studies addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, as well as the earlier SARS pandemic in the early 2000s. In 2021, he received the University of Calgary Sustainability Award for the innovation of his research, and in 2022, was named the Killam Annual Professor for Impactful Achievements in Research, Teaching, and Community Involvement. I can't think of a more perfectly articulated award that really represents David's breadth of contributions. Um, David was also recently inducted as a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. On a personal note, uh, David is a wonderful colleague and a true champion for children and families, particularly those with neurodevelopmental disabilities and diversity. He has been instrumental in advancing systems of care, particularly in relation to fostering community partnerships and navigational supports for families. He is also a community leader, both in his academic work and his volunteerism in creating inclusive environments aimed at supporting well-being and social connections for children and families. Today, I'm really thrilled uh, that David will be our keynote speaker. He will be sharing how children with health vulnerabilities and neurodevelopmental and mental health diversity and differences have experienced a range of challenges as a result of COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and I think the really exciting thing about his presentation is the inclusion of recommendations for practice and planning in pandemic preparedness, recovery, and the future of the health system. Um, I'm delighted to be moderating the question and answer period after the presentation. If you have any questions for Dr. Nicholas, please ask them via the Zoom chat function. The chat will only be visible to myself and Dr. Nicholas as we want to keep any distractions uh, from Dr. Nicholas's talk to a minimum. On that note, I'll just ask everyone to make sure that you're on mute as Dr. Nicholas is starting his presentation. And although um, the, the, although you will not see all of the questions coming in, please note that uh, that David and I will uh, see your questions, and I will uh, I will make sure that David has the opportunity to ask as many of them as time permits. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Nicholas. Welcome, David. Thank you. Great to be with you all. Thanks for the privilege of. Uh, coming to Wickery Research Day. Uh, I am just going to put on my presentation here. And I want to just first of all acknowledge the uh, co-investigators uh, co on the, in this work. And there's there's a range of, of colleagues and a, and a host of of research assistants and team members who have been a part of this. And just want to acknowledge several of the names you see here are in uh, at the, the University of Alberta, the Stollery Children's Hospital, as well as uh, at the University of Calgary and Alberta Children's Hospital and, and other regions in the country. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about basically two two items that uh, uh, Dr. Zweigenbaum has referred to. I want to introduce study findings related to some work that we've been doing addressing the experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic with a focus on the, the impacts on children with health vulnerability, uh, their parents and healthcare providers. And, and the three areas of focus I wanna to touch on are disruption in care, mental health strain and resilience. And then as, as Dr. Zweigenbaum uh, mentioned, I wanna return to some recommendations in moving forward. So in terms of the pandemic, if we look at, at uh, briefly at the literature, the, the impacts include rapid, sudden, and multiple changes in health and community care that, that we all have uh, experienced and, and could tell stories about that in, ac across this vast uh, virtual room. Um, there were significant implications for children and youth and those who support them through the stringent infection control measures, uh, uh, limits to in-person visitation and service access in terms of children with healthcare issues, um, heightened anxiety, fear, isolation, and, and a range of sequelae of impacts, and care provider tensions. So some of them uh, reflect regulatory control versus child and family-centered care and what that looks like 
in the midst of pandemic constraints and rigidity versus inconsistency of, of restrictions, um, shifting informations and benchmarks along the way. And so that presents the backdrop from the work that we that uh, colleagues and I have been involved in looking at uh, pediatric populations and care providers. And uh, so these are the, the populations that we looked at. And you'll note the, the variation of, of populations there, autism, children and youth with autism, mental health issues, uh, cardiac transplantation, end of life and bereavement. And in that sub uh, sample, we focused only on parents. So these were children who died during the pandemic and we reached out to parents uh, at least six months after the child's death. Uh, and children with hematological issues, primarily sickle cell disease and respiratory con conditions. Now this busy slide represents the, the multiple hands in this work. And I just wanna say thank you to our, our various partners. Um, and in terms of data collection, there was uh, in, uh, interviews with children and their parents, uh, separate or together based on their choice, although it was largely parents, as you'll see the numbers, um, focus groups with healthcare providers, and, and because of pandemic restrictions, the data was collected virtually uh, using an interpretive description design and content analysis that included um, coding, categorization, and, and uh, theme generation. So you'll see the numbers there per group and in total 286 participants across the participant groups. And then in terms of, of regions of data collection, it was Alberta and Ontario. And you can see the partners there, the various sites of data collection. Um, and uh, so Edmonton, Calgary, Ottawa, and Toronto. Want to move to findings, and uh, this finding will be no surprise to folks here. The the disruption that was imposed on by the pandemic, and uh, there was um, disruptions in terms of uh, daily routines, um, the vigilant infection control precautions that were part of um, care, both at home and in healthcare settings and other community places limited social outings and physical activity, a transition, rapid transition to virtual engagement and movement within the pandemic. So thinking about that as a process of, of uh, multiple years. Um, so school, health monitoring, therapy that was transitioned to virtual contexts and all that that meant, restricted in-person in interaction and and to a degree movement within society and with, within uh, spaces of care. Uh, new parental roles, we'll talk a little more about that and the, the strain that that, that uh, put on families, economic costs, and we're continuing to live with that with issues of inflation and, uh, and limited opportunity for youth to find a job and prepare for post-secondary education. That came out in our data which was, has not been talked about a lot, but some of the developmental shifts that were stalled along the way for, for children and youth as they move through the tra trajectory of transitions in their lives. In this talk, I wanna try to include a fair amount of content from participants, if I may. So I wanna start with this youth who talked about interrupted social interaction. And this was a youth in care and uh, was in quarantine. So listen to his words, and this might help us reflect back on some of the experiences. Of, this may seem extreme, but this, these were his words. You're only out of your room for an hour, an hour a day. You come out to use the washroom, and that would be it. You eat your meals in your room, and that it's just basically minimal human contract, contact. It's basically like solitary confinement for two weeks. Well, that may seem strong. The, the, the issues of adjustment and service delivery uh, will, uh, were experienced by all. So the public health and institutional guidelines and interpretation of those guidelines impose service shifts. So uh, that, that uh, had elements of uh, specialized care services transition to virtual platforms. So 
things like health check-ins uh, by Zoom or other, other uh, means, uh, mental health support, educational support, and, and in fact, schooling, closure or re reduction of integral supports uh, in children's lives and children's children with vulnerability. So uh, mental health supports, rehabilitation, uh, therapeutic uh, resources, accommodations for out of town visitors who were coming for, uh, for clinical reasons to healthcare centers, early childhood supports, youth advocates in the community. So a range of, of closures and interruptions that varied across the pandemic and the intensity of, of restrictions. And some needed services, what families described, such as early childhood assistance, youth advocates as, uh, uh, were not recognized as essential with, with implications in terms of their availability. So here's a quote from a parent about the rapid shifts in impeded services. Listen to this raw experience. On Friday and Saturday, the message was, yeah, the schools are going to be open. And then Sunday afternoon, it was, no, we are closing the schools. People need uh, more time to process this information and prepare, maybe make arrangements that would help. When it comes to daycares, of course, I do understand the need to take special measures to basically keep every, everybody safe. But I think daycare should stay open with strict protocol. I think that inability to go to work or kind of risking the job because you have to stay with your kids is a huge stress and takes emotional toll. I wanna to talk about adapting to care shifts. And this comes from a care provider who said, I think every day of my life, no matter what I'm doing in ICU, it's worse for the patients and families, like they're actually sick and this is actually their loved ones. It was already a difficult out of control experience, but you're now surrounded by people in hazmat suits, appropriate PPE, and you can't communicate with them well, and you can't read their body language, especially when they're using their high level medical speak. And then you're trying to figure out how worried they are, but all you've got is the eyes behind the mask. I just can't imagine how their imaginations must have tripled on running away with it and their baseline fear of COVID-19 plus the baseline constant news feeds about everyone dying. And so I think that it must have been atrocious and to lose the human connection, which is comforting, the challenge. So ongoing disruptions in operational protocols. So as we know, there were disruption or decreases in hospital visits and visitors with implications for children and families, uh, decreased movement and engagement inside the hospital. So here are some examples. Um, in, protocols uh, were, were in place to minimize an infection spread. So, so parents, so think about the, the, the pressure cooker of, of hospital uh, admissions. Parents unable to warm food as they're in the hospital and centralized kitchens. Parents can only sit in one chair at a child's bedside, continuous mask wearing during uh, healthcare providers' work shifts or parents' overnight stays. Those were some examples of, of the shifts that came along um, and inconsistent protocols across units and hospitals. And, and many children in, this sub, in these subgroups uh, were in multiple regions for different purposes. And so talked about the variation in application of guidelines across sites. So there is adaptation to and struggle with operational protocol. A healthcare provider said, uh, and this was at end of life, I had a patient who was actively dying and we called the other parent to come and be, be part of it with the child's mom who was obviously struggling and to tr try to, uh, and to try and get him in there before this child died. Security stopped him at the door and wouldn't let him through, it's the father. He's literally downstairs and then the hospital authority had to go down and speak to him to reinforce that the exception, you know, was only two hours and make sure he knew that before coming up, you need to know that before coming up, when I'm saying, no, get this father at the bedside now, 
it was really very challenging and very stressful for the entire team, feeling that, you know, barriers for when we had this exception, everyone agreed that this needed to happen. We couldn't get any of this placed in advance because bureaucracy, like the administration wouldn't let us get pre-advanced, you know, approvals to have a second parent be there. So we had to do it at the time. We heard stories like that of, of real harrowing experiences of families. Here's the sense of vulnerability of, of um, families uh, with uh, existing health conditions. The parent says, we are truly an immu immune compromised family. We're put in the same kind of category as others. Everyone has to be careful these days. On the flip side, we can't get masks as easily because everyone is getting masks. Remember that point along the pandemic? Us, when, when PPE was difficult to get. So for the people that really need the hand sanitizers, san sanitizer and things like that on an everyday basis, we'll have a harder time procuring those items in the future because everybody is feeling that they need to protect themselves, uh, feel that they need them to protect themselves as well. I want to talk a little bit about virtual care that presented benefits and opportunities for us to think about moving forward and challenges. So in terms of benefits, the accessibility and convenience for families and for care providers was substantial. When we think about the vastness of their country and the movement of patients within the system. On the other hand, the limits of, of technology. So some of them that were described to us were um, completing tests accurately and, uh, and to assess physical well-being, receiving collegial support, although there was instances, and I'll talk about this, where technology served well to that end, maintaining privacy, confidentiality, and engagement in clinical encounters, picking up on the, the, the nonverbal, the contextual cues, the body language, um, and, and expressing engaging nuance and connecting and, and maintaining rapport with, with some children and families, thinking about the resonance or not with technology uh, across various uh, families and population groups. There was a divide in terms of socioeconomics around access to computers and technology and uh, Wi-Fi connectivity. Worries about privacy. Here's a, a healthcare provider who conveyed this challenge in online communication. I did have a number of kids were speaking with them privately, which is their right to do, and working with an advocate was super challenging. There was a couple of early situations where I'm communicating virtually with a young person, and then I hear somebody else because I hadn't asked the young person, is this private? No. There's somebody standing there watching and listening. This happened maybe twice before it just became a new habit of mine to ask right at the outset, is this call private? Who's listening? Can I talk to them? Do you want them here? No. How else uh, can we have some privacy? And even with those safeguards, did we really know who was lurking in the background in those uh, virtual uh, sessions? So the impacts of these of existing gaps. So, so the, the pre-existing service delivery challenges were certainly um, heightened, made more visible in the pandemic. And, and so a lack of pre-existing and ongoing capacity and resources and services were amplified. So for some examples that we came across, mental health services, autism supports in the community, school-based services, those touch points that families face um, made, it was a perfect storm in terms of that much more challenging to address the existing gaps and the new gaps and challenges that emerged, emerged for children and families in the pandemic. And a lack of staff and resources um, due to some of the pandemic related pressures. So inadequate or lack of remuneration for sick leaves and isolation. So the, the insufficiently staffed sites and units and care settings, um, struggles for health care and other service providers in terms of workload and well-being 
and service delivery. So the strain on the uh, on existing barriers. Here's an example of that. COVID-19 even incre increased pre-existing barriers to accessing addiction and mental health services. The wait times were way longer because of social distancing or you know how many beds are available. There is an increase in isolation for some of those kids. And one provider talked about how the social distancing or the isolation led this person to die by suicide. So yes, it's definitely had a negative impact and the supports are just not there. And the supports were also weak prior to the COVID pandemic. So a, a system that is strained that was that much more strained with the sequelae of real life impacts. Another challenge was the array of information. So the, the plethora of information and the changing dynamic of public health and institutional health protocols um, and, the, and the volume of uh, messaging viewed as helpful, but challenging. And, and, and uh, our participant groups talked about targeted information, informational needs that uh, were, were variably sometimes not sufficiently uh, met. So for families, the COVID-19 risks for the child and the specific clinical context, so relative to the health condition, whereas a lot of the information was very generic to the general public. Strategies to support mental health was a priority for parents in helping their children navigate and, and strategies to support education and move forward and to not lose ground that uh, in some cases, parents had worked so hard to move forward. And for healthcare providers, a range of informational needs. So practice issues and wellness in their particular area of, of, uh, of uh, practice when to return to work after feeling unwell, work at home practices, um, infection management protocols, cleaning medical equipment, just to, to speak to some there. Some of those issues were particularly challenging early in the pandemic. One healthcare provider said this in terms of adapting and learning to manage amidst this rapidly shifting context. I learned quickly to slow my impression of a lot of information I was getting until it was confirmed from different sources so that you don't mislead patients and families. It's the volume that I found has been challenging because there's a wealth of information. It's hard to decide and decipher what's useful and what's not and what's true and what's not. I wanna talk a little bit about impacts on mental health and, and um, we know there was multiple negative impacts. So strain on, on uh, families, on healthcare providers, isolation, fatigue, anxiety, depression, or some of the, the issues that emerged in, in our data. A heightened impact on children with both health, social, and behavioral vulnerabilities. So some examples where there's particular strain with negative impacts, children with autism, uh, children with mental health challenges. Although in some cases, the pandemic allowed a more cloistered environment that took some of the social strains of, of kids with specific challenges that were uh, amplified by the pressures in society. Parents uh, were impacted by the multiplicity of responsibilities and their concerns for their child and, and their well being. Some parents avoided accessing hospitals out of fear, uh, and, and yet that had some implications in terms of addressing uh, physical health needs. And, uh, and, and some described attempting to seek mental health supports amidst these challenges but uh, were unaware of what was available uh, and or did not feel that virtual supports worked for them or they did not uh, wish to access those. And sometimes when they did, they were not commensurate to the need that was being presented. So here's an example of a parent who uh, described the, the increased demands and strain. So let's listen to this. I felt I was failing as a mom. I'm probably going to get emotional. I felt awful. I was so stressed out. My husband's hours at that point still hadn't been cut. He was still working regular hours. And so it was like, this is bogus. Like, I can't do this. 
me having a learning disability and having to teach my kids. My son's teacher and I weren't getting along. So some of her emails coming back at me were upsetting. I had to send them an email saying, for my mental health right now, I cannot have to feel the pressure of having my kids' schoolwork done because these marks that you're giving them are reflecting me. It is making me very depressed right now. I can't handle this. No, they're sitting there telling my kids they're doing their stuff wrong. Well, it's not them doing it wrong. Obviously, it's me teaching them wrong because I don't know what you're really asking. So the challenge is on top of addressing the, ch the child's health issues. So the stress pileup, that same quote, I now have pulled out here, the, the, the multiplicity of stresses on this mom. I was failing as a mom. Just feel that in terms of self-efficacy of going through that experience, what that might have been like. Stressed out. Husband's hours at this point still hadn't been cut. In other words, financial uh, family's livelihood implications. Like, I can't do this. Me having a learning disability and having to teach my kids, the mismatch of roles and demands on parents and on families, weren't getting along, re relational challenges, um, messaging back that was uh, challenging. Some of her messages coming back at me were upsetting. And then the comment, these marks that you're giving them are reflecting me. It's making me very depressed right now. I can't handle this. A sense of overwhelm in the midst of all this. It's me teaching them wrong, personalizing the, the, the environmental challenges on the self as a parent. I don't know. I don't know what you're really asking. That, that, those moments in the pandemic of confusion and overwhelm. Then I want to talk about our healthcare spaces. So varied reports of strain by our participants, isolation, low job efficacy, exhaustion, burnout. I think we've seen that emerge over time and, um, and uh, perceived risk, particularly early in the pandemic. Uh, so many uncertainties about risk to self and family at home. Workplace conflict regarding protocols and its application in context, and, and our relational challenges, verbal altercations regarding, regarding uh, the, the protocols and their application in context, conundrums of care, ethical issues in terms of the fit of, of good care and uh, safety, hence moral distress. So one participant said, the challenge was being not being my best professional self and said, we were already limited in resources for our patient populations going into the pandemic. And then the added moral distress from the pandemic, limiting these re, those resources even more. For me as a physician, that was really hard because you have a lot of years training for what you do well and to the best of your ability. But then when there's not a system or circumstances around you that allow that to happen, that sets the stage for moral distress and ethical dilemmas, I would say that's been the hardest part of the journey. So working across sectors, children don't just live in healthcare. So the negative mental health impacts on workers in areas deemed not essential. So the, the, um, the, the heightened stress among service providers in areas like mental health or autism, areas of our samples, um, due to feel, feeling undervalued by a system um, that where there was lack of, of resource capacity and sometimes a determination of those services as essential uh, with implications in terms of their av availability, such as um, challenges of autism support in schools as one example. So here's a service provider uh, who said non-essential services were closed and essential services were open and we sort of felt like we fit kind of in a middle ground there and so we really needed to figure out how to continue to provide services to our families we knew the families were going to be really struggling with kids out of school and out of routine but we weren't necessarily designated as an essential service in an obvious way so those that that challenge of what was available and what was not Another challenge was this, the impeded social connections and support. So reduced in-person connections and PPE that's got in the way of relational connections. And there was lots of 
attempts to mitigate that. And we'll talk about that. Um, but, th but the impact of uh, on quality and, and volume of relationality, of relationships. But the, the story wasn't just about increasing those or, or relaxing those, uh, those um, restrictions for some families. So lessening the restrictions did not necessarily reduce relational impacts for some families with particular vulnerabilities. So um, children were, were variably restricted in play with other children to COVID-19 risk, which uh, continued as things opened up and families felt vulnerable. L listen to this a quote from a parent. It's hard for a child with a heart transplant now that uh, things are opening up. She sees her friends playing together and they go on messenger. A couple of her friends went on play dates, but we're still not. So it wasn't bad when everybody was in the same boat, but I'm finding it harder now that things are opening up and we're still being cautious. Now we're different again, and that's been tough. So for some people, some families of kids with vulnerability, for instance, immunosuppressed children, their, their parents described this leveling of caution that they live with, and yet uh, there, that was um, maneuverable and shifted in the context of the pandemic. So multiple challenges in the transitions over time. I want to talk about the resilience, which we saw lots of evidence of. Um, silver linings, service, certainly service access and convenience for some families. When we think about the distance that families uh, go and the, the inconvenience of managing multiple uh, care experiences and visits um, and how that can be navigated through technology. Um, we saw practice adaptation and innovation and clinical team dynamics. dynamics. And so uh, online uh, outreach and collegial support um, and team and organizational leadership to support some of those good things in managing the complexities of the pandemic. So first, enhancing connections. So children and families reported, um, despite or amidst the challenges, increased connection in some cases due to more time at home. So and and uh, healthcare providers variably reported increased or maintained team co cohesion, uh, often reflecting uh, patterns pre-pandemic on teams and the strength of relationships. Here's a a, a youth who said, I got to talk with other people I never talked to before as much, and family, right? I don't talk to them much, and now I do. Being at home has made me realize that when I grow up, I want to be and name the discipline. So there was a reflection in growth and relationality. And we saw evidence of adaptation and resilience. Children, families, and healthcare providers uh, demonstrating ingenuity in their practice, resourcefulness, adaptation, care for others. Listen to this example from a healthcare provider. I think the one thing that resonated for me is that this virtual work has really made me reflect on approaching people from a place of grace, right? And affording grace. Just because there's so much going on in people's lives that we're not aware of. I think it's also a, mind, a reminder for me about being comfortable learning and not being right. Being able to shift and do things different based on the new information that you get, you know, in a single day. So it's having grace for others. I think it's grace for self and kind of having a bit of gentleness. And I don't know who said, like, we kind of don't know what people are going through. So that, that shifting that emerged in the pandemic for, for some amidst all the pressures and challenges. One of the, the, the resources that were utilized were networks of support. I think this is a lesson in moving forward that we brought into the pandemic, but may want to continue and, and amplify as we move forward. So knowledge networks were used by healthcare providers, particularly in specific clinical areas for updated and tailored information for clinical populations. And in some cases, they were networks from across the world to glean the lessons learned uh, regarding a particular patient population and, and specific care uh, for that uh, subpopulation. 
There were examples of formal, informal, and impromptu care and social support networks. So a few examples were um, families who received virtual support from hospital and community groups where care uh, on our in-person care was pivoted to online mechanisms quickly and and uh, which was deemed effective and impactful sometimes it was more challenging but there were instances where uh, there it had was described as having a positive effect and and in terms of healthcare providers the collegial support that was offer, offered via connection online and in sometimes with um, help in managing time in terms of the, the, the less, the um, instances where there was less commuting, less moving around to get to various meetings and in particular support networks. This notion of support network development appeared to reflect, at least in our data, um, team strength and community connections uh, that were preempted before the pandemic. So, I, I, and, and leadership that was, was supportive of this level of uh, engagement. And, and I think there's a lesson here in terms of moving forward around um, creating those networks and the safety and trust to move forward well in some of these networks of support and how critical they are when the networking and the connection is actually constrained, such as in pandemics. Here's an example from a parent the hospital team, because of COVID-19, ended up having a lot of online programs and online resources. It's just tough because it's been a year since my son passed away, but every month they send us a letter or a poem written by another parent, an experience of another parent. Normally, I would have had to access these by going a lengthy distance to where the hospital is. A lot of that travel was cut out, and I think that helped me. So I think the online piece helped. They do the memorial as well, every few months for the parents and families, all those things I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have done if it wasn't online. So the, these online resources have some benefits. And I think that, that our, our challenging question is to think about how do we move forward well. So an administrative team leadership was important. Um, teams variably viewed were viewed to inform pandemic adaptation through information and emotional support. The, the pivoting around technology and IT support was important uh, and greater transparency and justification in system decision-making was variably sought, um, which has some implications in terms of communication and pandemics. I wanna just go to some um, lessons in moving forward for children and families. Some of the interventions, the work with children really spoke to what they described as increased awareness of hygiene and mitigating infection risk. Families described proactively seeking help, sometimes with mixed results, um, but some, some um, advocacy skills varying amongst families and uh, an amplified attention on supportive relationships and nurturing those both before, during, and after I, the pandemic. Lessons learned at a society and systems level. One is to tailor pandemic messaging and decision-making and supports to include subspecialty population needs so, and, and calibrate that to the, the frontline considerations of that population. There was a need to support cross-sectoral and intersectional needs of children and families. And I think that's a lesson in moving forward. Uh, an increased focus on mental health needs and uh, resources, and critically and carefully reflecting on child and family-centered care within pandemic constraints. Those two uh, buffer against one another at times, and yet how do we determine that right balance or tension? And lastly, consider the, the definitions and context of essential services and for whom. So these are some societal and systemic level uh, lessons in moving forward. For staff and program preparedness and support, clinical and ethical decision-making in a pandemic, um, thinking about what that is and how that is supported. How do we make those tough decisions and are there guidelines and principles that could guide that work? 
um, the role of in-person and or virtual care and potentially hybrid models in moving forward and in pandemics. Intersectional and cross-sectoral needs of children and families. So things, you know, some examples that are on the screen are pandemic adaptation, but also health, addressing health needs, um, education, community. Uh, how do we address the, the differential barriers in terms of social determinants of health? And ensuring proactive human resources policies to buffer workplace demands. So some examples given were uh, remuneration for shifted work, billing systems, uh, time allocated per case, which were shifted uh, during pandemic. Um, a, uh, a, a service provider spoke to this uh, transparent and principled decision-making in pandemic planning and responsiveness. I think of the one of the main pieces of work that really helped us and really drove us forward and has helped and has held us steady today, six months later. And I would recommend that any organization going through anything similar to this in the future is to develop a set of principles by which to make decisions and spend time on that. We were able to develop about five principles and we've gone back to that several times. We have we had a lot of input from the staff. It's very much a shared development of those principles. That is a recommendation because I think that really helps helps to figure out what's most important for you as your organization and how to make decisions. Interesting and helpful advice. I want to just end with a couple slides here about the, the pandemic journey. And it really was a journey. It was emerging processes over time. There was system reactivity early in the pandemic, restrictions, imposition, uh, and then continual recalibration and, and eventual relaxation that brought uh, ongoing shifts, communication requirements and challenges, vulnerability, adjustment and absorption of that those challenges, and varying anxiety, resilience, uh, and responding to that. And as things have shifted, there has been a movement of experiences and maybe going back and forth of adjustment, confusion, frustration, malaise and fatigue. And if we, if we hold around the room, we, I'm sure we could find lots of other descriptors. Um, and then system recovery and renorming and thinking about this as a time of deep system reflection uh, and uh, thinking about preparedness in either future waves of a pandemic or uh, other pandemic or emergencies or disasters. And thinking in terms of preparedness uh, as a system and as at those various levels, the micro, meso, macro values, child and family centeredness amidst pandemic constraints. They're very real life impacts on the various uh, players in, in the, this context and transparency in this focus emerged as, as critical things to think about in moving forward. I want to end just with some, some overall thoughts. And uh, one was that there was consistent and differential impacts. The pandem pandem pandemic journey has been in varying ways a traumatic experience, loss and grief, system gaps amplified, and we need to think, therefore, about mid and longer term impacts, uh, mental health challenges, health system strain that we're navigating currently, uh, just as some examples. So emerging lessons and opportunities are the use of virtual care. What, what is the right uh, approach for what, for what circumstances and contexts? Practice societal and systemic vulnerability and think about how do we prepare and, and as much as we can mitigate for the uncertainties. The importance of strong leadership, proactivity, transparency, uh, communication and calibrating that uh, important uh, resource in terms of leadership. Ensuring the voices of children, families and healthcare providers are, are heard in the mix of, of that process the important role of networks and connections, particularly as those very networks and connections are constrained. 
and, and the need for proactivity in pandemic planning, not to wait until the pandemic to do the planning, but rather deep planning uh, as we uh, reflect and move forward. And uh, this work really leads to further research and partnership opportunities um, and, and that really have been exemplified in this research. And thanks to my many partners and colleagues in this work. Um, some, some ideas and moving forward are thinking about the lingering impacts, our recovery, intervention, pandemic planning, just to name a few. I'm gonna end just thanking again, the families who participate in this, the healthcare providers, uh, and our partners and the team. And uh, thank you all for your attention to this work. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, David. Um, it, it's a, it was a wonderfully insightful and thought provoking presentation. I've always admired both the humanity and the scholarly approach that you take to this work. I'm really struck by the schematic on the last slide. And I'm just commenting, I, uh, I, I'm, Please, can I invite everyone to put their questions in the chat? Um, be great to have uh, your feedback and, and thoughts and questions for, for Dr. Nicholas to discuss. I'm going to start with, um, uh, I'm, yeah, here we go. We have a question from Karen. Um, thank you for sharing these findings. Uh, reflecting on the overall impacts of these findings, what do you, th do you think the weather, I'm sorry, that, I'm going to just ask the, uh, Karen to restate that question. I can't quite understand the last bit of it there. And perhaps, David, while, while Karen is doing that, I just have a question. Um, you know, I, I wanted to observe that these issues are pretty raw, um, and I suspect there are many people uh, in the group today where a lot of the things that the issues that you talked about in the quotes from the participants really resonated with them at, at multiple levels. Um, you talked about um, where we're heading is sort of both this combination of recovery and renorming. But I think for many families and healthcare providers, of course, they're not really quite experiencing that recovery yet. Although certainly um, there's been lessons learned based on the adaptations that we've had to take. Um, you talked about the um, some really important implications for thinking about pandemic and public health preparedness for the next crisis. Can you comment a bit further on, um, you know, what are the um, what are your thoughts for the way forward in terms of addressing the deeper health systems issues that came to the surface under the strain of the pandemic, um, but 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 that people continue to grapple with. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. It's a, it's a big question, but the the thinking deeply around, um, I think that the levels of impact and their, and how they impact the various uh, stakeholders. And so the importance of having uh, stakeholders at the table to represent both those, those areas of impact, but thinking deeply about how those can be addressed. Um, and uh, at the, the, the micro, at the very service delivery level, but also at the, at the programming and at the, the systems level, the macro levels. And uh, so I think really thinking about that, a transparent process um, and, and looking at that. And, and you're right, I think we're in the midst of it now. And, and these experiences, we're, we're still there. They're, they are raw. And, and um, yet the, I think a risk is that when the pressures abate, we sort of want to put this all away and go move on to other things and, and not be proactive in planning for these kind of experiences and other disasters that we're seeing in, in other uh, elements of, of, uh, of life. So it's so, so important to really think about this proactively and moving forward. Great. Thanks, David. We have a question from uh, Andrew Greenshaw, um, who, who um, comments, great presentation. In the face of these kinds of challenges, is there a way we can gauge the needs of stakeholders in terms of formal qualitative or quantitative feedback that would be safe and easy to provide and how to respond to? Um, so, um, so, you know, kind of distilling some of these messages in ways that are kind of actionable and inform some next steps. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a great question. Um, and I, you know, I think there's, there's multiple answers. I mean, some of this work that we're doing, we're trying to distill this into um, bite-sized pieces of information um, for specific targeted audiences. And um, so we are, 
um, for instance, some of the, the, the subspecialties in clinical areas and populations, we're trying to um, take information that is specific to those areas or to, and groups. But I also think, that, you know, taking some of the, the learning and uh, being, you know, almost thinking strategically around how do we make that accessible and opening up lines of communication for uh, groups to reflect on. And I, I've seen examples of that in some of our groups where clinical teams have opened up avenues for families to communicate directly with teams and have forms of communication and important venues for integration of information, sharing of information in both ways. So healthcare providers learn from families, families learn from healthcare providers, and we learn broadly about the systems and challenges and have pathways to move that forward through the system in, in terms of addressing some of these really important and challenging areas. Terrific. Um, Todd, do we have time for one last question? Okay, awesome. So question that just came in, again, thank you for such an awesome lecture. Did you see the psychosocial mental health experience of children and parents? Um, did it vary in ways around, um, around ethnicity and or kind of economic means? Um, it, one of the limitations, and I didn't speak to this in the, in the research, is that this was largely a convenient sample. We, we accessed those who were willing to participate and uh, we sought diversity in the sample. Um, I, we were certainly undersampled in terms of children's uh, in, uh, input. So we heard largely from parents and healthcare providers. And we didn't specifically target variation in terms of uh, uh, socioeconomics or uh, social determinant of health barriers. Notwithstanding that real limitation, what we saw were differences. and. Um, the you know one example was the challenge for challenges for families in rural locations when they needed to um, be in in uh, urban centers for specialty based care and what that looked like in terms of resources and uh, and so it really amplified some of the the challenges for that population when when other resources were were uh, were not available I remember one instance where a, a, a father from out of town was at was at at experience near end of life of his child and was in the the underground parking lot of a healthcare facility and couldn't get into the the facility and was trying to navigate that in the parking lot without connectivity of phone or um, or uh, or internet access and uh, and everything else in the community was shut down so you know that's an example of uh, and, and a challenge. The other is our reliance on technology presumes that there that that internet and computer access is affordable and accessible, and we can't necessarily make that assumption given the vastness of our country geographically and the socioeconomic differences. So those are a few examples. Great, thanks, David. And uh, one final question that we uh, have in the chat. Um, Given the suggestion of the broader stakeholder consultation with recovery and renorming, do you anticipate, David, any significant shift with planning priorities within public health in the future? Do you have any predictions that you would speculate on? Yeah, that's a good question. I, you know, the 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 COVID nineteen pandemic has been just so um, cataclysmic and and um, grand in terms of its impact that I I. I suspect there will be a, a lot of rethinking about what are the lessons learned in moving forward. And I know this research and, and other research is looking carefully and, and other endeavors are looking at how do we impact and provide information to really rethink uh, our preparedness strategies or, or augment them in moving forward and taking the important lessons of what we've collectively gone through what families individually or uniquely have experienced given their circumstance and move that forward to shifts in, uh, in practice and, and policy. Okay. Terrific. So it's just past the top of the hour. I really want to thank everyone for their uh, thoughtful and insightful questions and the terrific discussion. And I'm going to turn it back over to, uh, to Dr. Alexander.
Hey, thank you, Lonnie, and thank you, David. I echo Lonnie's uh, the comments. It was an illustrating, an illuminating presentation, um, and I'm sure there were there were many great questions, and we could continue discussing this probably for hours. Um, important topic. Um, if you're one of the non-research day attendee guests, um, thank you again for joining us. Um, if you're part of the WIPRI Research Day, um, it's time for our second round of oral and poster presentations. So to accomplish getting to the oral and poster sessions, what you need to do is hit the little lead button in the bottom of Zoom. Feel free to do that now. But then you need to log back into feed loop platform. Uh, and then navigate to the session you're interested in. Don't forget to keep sharing your experiences on social media as well as stop by the virtual photo booth for a fun picture using the hashtag WICRI RD2022 uh, exclamation mark. Uh, be sure to add a message of thanks to our foundations on our uh, Padlet community bulletin board. And don't forget to check your email messages before the end of our day. I know I got mine for our 3MT People's Choice Awards. Um, and then once it's all done, please join us at 4.30 in the closing remarks room to wrap up the day. Thank you again, David. It was lovely um, hearing from you and uh, good to hear the discussion. Um, have a good day, everyone.